gently red my cheeks a little bit. Okay, we're ready. Okay, okay uh, biochar. Uh, elevator well, introduce speech. yourself. I'm Ray Gallion. Mm -hmm. I am the uh, uh, titled myself the chief biochar advocate of the Sonoma Biochar Initiative, and the purpose of biochar uh, chiefly is as a climate response. It's the idea of taking carbon out of the air through plants, which are the only technology that knows how to do that. And then when those plants are usefully done, we can take them and run them through a process that turns them into carbon that's very stable. And that carbon is then used in agriculture as a soil amendment. So that carbon that was once in the air is now in the ground, stable for a very long time. That's the big climate purpose of biochar. The value to agriculture at the current moment is as a soil amendment because it's a very beneficial soil amendment. It adds soil organic carbon, which is generally wanting in most agriculture. It, uh, it has many characteristics which are beneficial in and of themselves. It filters water going in. It filters gases coming out because in agriculture when you disturb the soil it does outgas both methane and nitrogen oxide, both of which are very substantial greenhouse gases. So in production agriculture the contribution of those gases to greenhouse gas problem is substantial. And it's very hard to deal with except perhaps through this method. That's all being tested now. Uh, similarly, those gases have value to them and part of what happens is they get turned into available plant nutrients. So you're preventing the outgassing but you're also benefiting, benefiting the agriculture. You begin to cycle these materials back through the plants which was the purpose of the plant in the first place. Mm -hmm. Recycling everything, closing the loop, that's part of what this is. So biochar is charcoal, strictly speaking, but it's made in a different way. That process is called pyrolysis, which is a contained uh, process. Normally, if you think of making charcoal, you think of somebody making a big pile of wood, starting a fire, covering it with dirt, waiting three days while it smolders. Well, those gases that come off of it that eventually leave the carbon behind are very valuable. You shouldn't just dump them in the air because they're polluting. They add to, they add to uh, uh, carbon, uh, the, what they call black carbon soot pollution, which actually goes global and creates a problem when it settles out on the ice caps, it makes them darker. And when it makes them darker, that absorbs heat. So you're absorbing heat directly into the ice, which adds to planetary warming. So two solutions that the climate scientists have advised for what they call fast mitigation technologies. One of those is black carbon reduction, which is reducing soot. So that's improving the efficiency of cook stoves that are used in the third world, which are basically variations of an open fire. So you make those more efficient so that you don't have as much soot, and then you have less of that soot pollution. Also, these small stoves can be used where that original fuel that would have been so dirty is, is heated efficiently, sometimes even making biochar, which can then be used in local agriculture. So you're actually getting the energy value out of the wood without sending all this carbon away. So you're reducing the carbon emissions, which we want, and you're able to gather that carbon and put it away in soils, which we also want. So those are the two fast mitigation technology, making biochar and sequestering it in soils and reducing the emissions of black carbon through efficient cook stoves and improved diesel engines. So that's the mitigation strategy that's brought forward by the climate scientists and the technical phrase that they use in climate talks is fast mitigation technology. The value to agriculture is not just these excellent characteristics, which, it, uh, which are also um, improve soil tilt, the characteristics of the soil. It, it, uh, it does the filtration that I mentioned, but it also has the capability of what's called enhanced cation exchange. It's, a, uh, it's basically a positively uh, ionized material, so it actually helps in the transmutation of, of 
the um, uh, minerals and so forth that that are part of the absorption of plant nutrients. So that's a positive soil characteristic. So all these things taken together, plus the fact that as a material, biochar is a very porous material. You think about it, you take a piece of wood, a twig, whatever, and you, you heat it up so all of the volatiles, all the stuff that's in it that isn't carbon comes out. And what you end up with is this framework of what was there. So it's a very porous material. It's like a, a skeletal structure that's all carbon. And that porous material is very attractive to microorganisms as a place to live. It's like adding condominiums into the soil, which all these critters want to live in. So they're attracted by the carbon chemistry, they're attracted by the ionic characteristics of the material, and they're attracted by the carbon. All of this makes it a very lively area to improve your soil. So this knowledge came from the exploration of what the uh, Amazonian indigenous people did for several thousand years before Pizarro came along and introduced those European diseases which wiped them out there were uh, active cities there that are estimated to be between uh, 45 and 85 million people this is in about the year 1450 or so and Pizarro came along right around 1500 so they had concentrated areas of agriculture and the way that they did that they took these thin tropical soils which didn't build a lot of a lot of uh, biomass that biomass is what we rely on here for our agriculture you get a large humic layer and that actually builds soil our our uh, central plains um, when Europeans first got here uh, it was a hundred feet deep of actual soil of actual active soil because of all the all the uh, buildup of material over time and we have since pretty much wiped that out so so you end up with a, a severe problem because we didn't manage our soil and all washed off with heavy agriculture there they started with very thin soils and they had to build them up and the way they did that was by taking their cultural detritus most of which was woody waste and they made charcoal pits out of it and they took that charcoal and they incorporated that into their agriculture. Some of those soil profiles that they've examined are over 4,000 years old with carbon that's still original. So this material is very stable. That's the climate advantage. You put it in the ground and it stays there. So you have a known volume of material that you can put away, that you can account for, that you can say that amount of carbon has been sequestered. So it's a very it's a very easy accounting in terms of climate science. Oh. It's also beneficial for a very long time because this anthropogenic, which means human-made soil, is still there. It's still vital. And the locals mine it for soil amendment for other places. That's how attractive it is. So this becomes a a process that we can use for millennia to build, maintain, stable agricultural soils that don't just waste away and then we have to move on to some other place. So we can we can stabilize agriculture, we can stabilize the climate, we can build soil, we can increase our biomass production which will allow us to maintain that cycle. In addition to that, we this process allows us to draw off energy because the energy gases that once went to smoke are now available to run generators or to make process heat for for industrial activities or, or agricultural related activities. One example is a poultry farmer in West Virginia who had a big waste problem with all of his poultry manure and that manure was costing costing him money. He had to pay money for uh, propane to heat his brood houses and this guy was producing 800,000 birds a year. That was a big expense to him. So he found a way to, uh, and with some funding help, it was an experimental technology, to make biochar out of, uh, out of this poultry manure. And the idea was to offset some of his energy costs, because you heat this stuff up and then you've got process heat that you can heat the brood houses with. Well, not only did he offset all of his propane costs, mm -hmm. turns out that in processing this material, 
he went from a waste material that he could hardly give away to a material that comes out that people want to buy for about $450 a ton. So overall he's ending up with multiple value streams, he's offsetting previous costs, and he's a happy camper. So these are the kinds of, of value streams that you can see to add when you bring in a process like this. The bigger concept is that, that in reality there is no such thing as waste. There's merely the transfer of outputs that end up somewhere. Right now we've not been very good at that. Our wastes have ended up piling somewhere without value. So that's why we think of it as garbage, as waste. But in fact, we can close the loop in a lot of our designs to improve these strategies. So this is one way that we can do that with, with agricultural wastes that have uh, an inherent carbon value and uh, are currently being uh, wasted in the traditional sense. Uh, overall, I think we've got a, a real opportunity to move forward on this technology. <laughs>